Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. Uh, I have the pleasure today of being joined by Jim Moritz of Chicago Drum. Jim, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Bart. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. It is a pleasure to talk to you. Um, So today we are talking about Slingerland drums, um, something that you hold uh, very close to your heart. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your connection to Slingerland? Well, my connection is I kind of have a a family history of people working at the uh, Chicago and Niles plants. Um, I had two great uncles work there back in the day. One, uh, I believe the story I heard was uh, on the guitar banjo end. Um, And then another one uh, was in the wood shop, was actually in charge of the wood shop um, for Slingerland. And uh, my dad actually was in charge of the wood shop after my great uncle um, in the Niles plant. Wow. Um, now also I, I was there in my, my high school years, um, early, early to mid seventies, um, you know, it was a uh, night shift when, you know, there was a big spit out of, of drums, you know, they had a couple of shifts going and, uh, summer vacations were kind of spent at the Slingerland plant. So kind of, kind of Slingerland in the blood, I guess. Yeah. You were, you're born and raised with, uh, with Slingerland. So how far does that date back with your family working there? Um, you know, I'm not exactly sure of the uh, guitar end great uncle. Um, I believe it was 30s, 40s. You know, the drums were were there, I believe, in the 20s. I, I can't remember the dates offhand now uh, when they started doing the, you know, actual drums. But um, uh, I believe he was around as well with the drums, too. Why don't you, in your in your you know you don't have to be too specific, but why don't you run us through what you know about the history of Slingerland, starting as far back as you can uh, as you can go? Well, you know, as far back as I can remember, you know, it was uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, banjos um, and guitars, and I believe they were like the first company to have an electric guitar out too um, back in the day. Um, but um, you know, with uh, the Ludwig. Uh, boys let's say uh they started their uh company you know with with drums and and uh slingerland wanted to get into that too um you know there was a little uh downfall with the uh the advent of the talking movies uh, um so there was less uh you know drummers going going uh, to get you know the traps and and all the accessories for that type of thing and uh slingerland kind of just kind of snuck in there and uh and they never stopped going for a while, you know, um, they, they, they made their impression in, in the, in the footprint of drum making and, uh, um, they, they kept it going pretty good. I think I read in Rob's book in the Slingerland book that it, it said that, um, it was kind of in retaliation where Ludwig was saying, well, we're going to get into banjo making, um, to get, a, I'm kind of getting this mixed up, but I think it was to get military contracts for making banjos, Whereas Slingerland was going after that 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 bid that contract, and they said, "Well, hey, guess what? Now we're going to make drums because you're you're kind of messing with right, our yeah. our area." Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was never never any any really love between the two companies. Um, uh, they were always kind of kind of going at it with with things. Um, you know, um, it was just. Uh, a lot of different things going, you know, in the, in the sixties, it was, uh, we're getting ahead of ourselves here, but, yeah. uh, there was a big controversy with the, uh, the drum head making, um, you know, so, uh, um, it, it was just always kind of going back and forth. It was a, uh, very competitive between the two of them. Um, even, you know, when my dad, uh, we, funny story is we went to the plant in Niles last year after the drum show and, uh, we weren't allowed, allowed in it, but, uh, I had a couple of friends from out of town and, uh, we grabbed my dad and, uh, we just walked around the plant on the outside and he was telling stories about, you know, putting, putting these, uh, big posts, uh, by the parking lot so they could put chains across to keep the Ludwig guys out. Oh my God. Um, there's, there's also stories of, um, uh, Bill the third, uh, when he was younger, um, uh, 
B B number two uh, wanted to go over to the Splinterland plant and uh, kind of fish through the uh, dumpsters to see what Slingerland was up to. Um, I don't know any vice versa stories, but I'm sure there's you know Slingerland going to Ludwig as well. So there there was this you know competitive edge uh, between both companies. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. Did you? I know Ludwig and Slingerland have this history of going at it. Were in the Big Four were Rogers and Gretsch. Was there competition with this as well? I know Rogers was very, very um, progressive in their hardware and all that stuff. Was there as much uh, animosity between those companies, or is it? It's historically Ludwig and Slingerland at each other's throats, right? And and I'm not sure of you know Ludwig and Gretsch, but they were out more east, whereas you know. I mean, they, they might have been having that together, you know, out yeah. that way. But uh, being so, um, you know, both Ludwig and Slingerland were in the Chicago area. I mean, they were competitive with uh, getting calf skins back in the city back in the day. Um, you know, everybody wanted to get the, the finest, the best. And yeah. uh, they were they were both out there ready to, you know, pick and choose what, what they could get, you know. was We're kind of jumping around here, but was Slingerland making their own calfskin heads at this point i know a lot of times in in this era people you kind of had to make all your own stuff you didn't really have the resources we have today so were they cre- were they creating their own calfskin heads um yeah i believe so i mean i i can still remember the uh you know, they, they had calfskins um, stacked uh, in the plant when I was there a, a little bit too. Um, you know, so yeah, they were making, you know, they were uh, tacked on calf, calf skins and there were tucked calf skins. So yeah, they were, they were doing their own stuff. Wow. Well, that's cool. So Jim, why don't we run through a little bit of the family history of, uh, of the Slingerlands and um, we can touch on a little bit about how they, how they, how HH got started really early on in music, but um, yeah, let's just kind of go through the family tree a little bit. Okay, well, you know, the actually, you know, the HH, he, he was the one who kind of started it all. Um, you know, the, he was in uh, with his brother, I believe, um, uh, Arthur James, I think it was yep. called. I think that's um, right. You know, and and they kind of got together and, and were working together. Um, uh being uh hh was you know more the uh the guy in charge and uh um, aj being sales and and that type of deal and then so moving forward the company then went into the hands of uh henry jr correct also known or referred to as bud with two d's um yeah, and I I don't know actually the timeline. I believe HH got ill uh, as well as as, uh, as Bud did um, later on. Um, but uh, yeah, Bud Bud came in. Uh, he had to have been in the fifties, uh, early fifties, I believe, um, when he actually started running the company. So it seems like Bud um, or Henry Jr. would be in charge of the company during the uh, really the heyday of Slingerland. Is that correct? Kind of the the jazz explosion into the '60s, '70s rock era stuff. Well, I mean, you know, you got to back up a little bit with the heyday because, and I don't know uh, timelines again. I'm I'm not sure of, of when, but uh, Gene Krupa, um, you know, uh, was signed on with with Slingerland and. and uh, I guess you can compare it to, um, you know, Ludwig in the sixties with Ringo. I mean, Krupa was, you know, he, he, he kind of invented that, that drum set and yeah. made it a popular instrument. I mean, Gene Krupa appears to be like, I know, uh, in, in the book I read where it's, it's talking about, Hey, like, Hey, I need to not have these tack heads. Let's do, um, let me actually be able to tune these. Can you do that? The and tunable then, drum, the heads, tunable the tunable drum. Palms yeah. And, so then right. they they did that for him, and it there was. Right. I, I think I saw in in the book where it said um, he was on most every drum catalog for Slingerland, like the cover of every catalog, um, except later in the sixties. Yeah, up until like I don't know sixty seven, maybe his last uh, appearance, something like that. Yeah. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. He was. Yeah. And. And you know he he did uh, he did great for Slingerland sales. Um, you know, like I said, it was it was kind of like the you know the the Ludwig version of the uh, the, the Ringo when when after the Ed Sullivan show type deal. Um, yeah. You know he he did a lot for for drummers and and drumming. Um, you know, so there's a lot to be said for 
for Mr. Krupa. <laughs> Absolutely. And that, that's a big influence on people, and that leads to people uh, buying more drums because they want to be like their uh, their hero. Now, um, did he have right. any did, yeah. he, did he have any weird – I know with Buddy Rich, he's jumping around with different snare drums, and he's getting in trouble for using the Fibes snare when he's supposed to be using – I um, believe it was the Ludwig uh, Super Sensitive, I think, or something like that. Gene seems like he didn't have quite as many like uh, hang-ups on switching drums and being a little uh, shady about that. Was he was he pretty loyal? Oh yeah, uh, very loyal. And in fact, he he didn't even want new stuff. He liked the old stuff, and and uh, they wanted to get the the newer stuff in his hands. You know, um, so they had to. They had to get that into his hands um, and, and get it out there so people could see the, the newer stuff as well as, you know, the old stuff. So now post post jazz explosion with Gene Krupa um, and we get into the 50s and the 60s. How is the company doing then? Is is our sales through the roof? Is is everything going great at this point? Yeah, they they actually were were doing very well. Um, you know, they they kind of outgrew the uh, the old plant uh, um, in Chicago, and uh, Bud decided to uh, go ahead and and build a new plant, and he did. Um, and uh, the groundbreaking was, uh, I believe, 1960. I actually was there um, at a groundbreaking. There was a it was a basically a farm with a, a big farmhouse and everything, and. Wow. Uh, um, they had a, a company picnic they held, and uh, Krupa was there with his uh, quartet. Um, don't remember that, but I, I do remember, you know, the, the, the firemen, you know, and, and I was, you know, all of, you know, three, four years old, I believe, at that point. Um, but uh, later, later in my high school years, I find out I, I took a uh, took drum lessons from uh, a Slingerland endorser, and he lived. Uh, right around the area locally here, uh, Jake Jerger, and uh, was talking to him one day, and he's like, yeah, I was there too, you know? So I, I actually was there when my drum teacher was there too. That's so awesome. That was kind of cool to find out. Um, but, uh, yeah, the uh, the plant was opened, uh, I believe, in, in 60. Um, you know, I can back up a little bit. Um, you know, my dad my dad uh, joined uh, Slingerland about 1955. Um and he was always working in the wood shop. Uh, he was one of the first. Uh, he was the first guy to use the RF machines when those when that one came in. Um, RF machine is radio radio frequency is a real you know high voltage uh, machine um, that they use to form the shells. Um, you know prior to that uh, they would have uh, to make the shells. They would have to uh, make a press. They called it. Mm-hmm. Um, where they had a big a big table and they they glue up the the layers of you know the three plies and and um, they do you know one layer and then put like wax paper over it do another layer and then they have these big uh, acne screws with these big wheels that they'd uh, screw down to tighten up and put pressure on them and uh, glue them all flat and then they would actually roll the uh, shells to shape them. Um, so all the plies were made already, like a, a thin piece of plywood, and they would roll them. Um, back in the day, you would see they would actually put the finish on them, and the finish would be inside that that uh, that scarf uh, yeah. lap joint where it overlaps. I've seen that. Um, it's amazing to see an outer, like an upper, and you see the the wrap actually become a part of the of the shell. I'm sure I'm sure rewrapping that is a nightmare. But... Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not too bad, but it, it it's done. <laughs> um, so, so the RF machine, um, you know, my dad, that, that was, he was put on that and that's what he ran, um, for quite a while. Um, and you know, nobody, it was, it was all totally new. He had to figure out how to glue it properly. Um, you know, all the adjustments on it and, and everything else. It's, uh, it was quite a wild machine. Um, you know, and, and that was brought over into the Niles plant. You know, they brought two more of those, so they had a total of three of them, um, and they used those until they closed up. Um, you know, but yeah, it's uh, you know, they they actually they actually had to bring extension cords. Uh, the story goes uh, when they moved into the Niles plant because uh, all the electrical wasn't done yet. But uh, Bud wanted to get things up and going, so he told employees to bring extension cords and everything else. So, wow, um, man, yeah. <laughs> you just got to start making drums. I mean, this is 1960 where 
uh, I don't know the exact year that um, Ringo, the Beatles were on the Ed Sullivan show, but I know that's just after that, it was just the explosion of people buying drums. Yeah, it was that was about 64, I yeah, believe. Yeah. So, yeah. Big upswing after that. Is that the way it went? Well, you know, Ludwig was was really big upswing on it. Oh, you yeah. know, Slingerland, you know, I mean, being being how the Ludwig drums are out there, so everybody wanted, you know, that finish, that brand, um, you know, and uh, you know, then then the rock era came in. Um, Slingerland was always pretty much, uh, you know, jazz oriented. You know, the, I mean, you look at all their endorsers and stuff at the time, but they did get uh, quite a few, you know, rock endorsers, you know, coming coming in and uh you know it, there, there was quite a roster uh for both companies um but uh yeah it's uh you know there was all sorts of people coming in in and out of there you know um back in the day what about stencil drums and, and copying the slingerland model does that did that cause a problem for the company or did they really even care well you know um i know Way back when, uh, Slingerland did let a lot of the Japanese people in there, and they came in and they were taking pictures of the plant and everything else. I mean, I know I know my dad, you know, hid uh, certain uh, you know blue formula bottles and everything else that was laying around and covered things up uh, when he could. But um, you know that that kind of all led to the demise too, because um, you know they were they were nice enough to let them in there and 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 tour the plant, but um, it kind of it kind of bit them on the backside because um, after that the, uh, the the foreign market started coming in too, you know. Um, so they took a, a a chunk of the pie out out of out of the American companies. Do you know what his, I mean, uh, cause it's funny. We talked about how they, in the previous episode about how I was asking, would they pursue legal ramifications? Not knowing that they were inviting them in. Do you know what the, uh, what the goal was to bring the, the Japanese like builders, or I guess it would be the people investing in the drums into the Slingerland plant. What were they trying to achieve with that? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not really sure. Just goodwill, um, maybe. Goodwill, maybe maybe they were hoping to get some of their product more more overseas. I, um, I don't know, um, but uh, yeah, the Japanese just kind of kind of came in strong after a while, and uh, wow, you know that kind of kind of didn't didn't do do too good for the uh, the American companies. Well, that's I mean amazing because the um, the history of the stencil kits is is pretty. Um... Uh, you know, word of mouth and slightly uh, just kind of like stories thrown together. So I'm pretty, pretty confident that you just added a new uh, element to the the history of um, of the stencil drum world because knowing that they that Slingerland invited them into the factory is is extremely interesting. Um, we'll have to I'll have to tell Mark Patch that the guy who's writing the book and maybe maybe you'll be in the second or the third edition I think of of his book. <laughs> All right, so. The 60s and 70s are going really strong for Slingerland. A lot of endorsers, both jazz and rock, they are competing with the uh, stencil drums, which, uh, as we found out, they um, kind of helped launch, which is uh, amazing to me. But um, then we get into the 1980s. Um, I think, as far as I can tell, this is when things start to get a little bit uh, funky for Slingerland. Well, I mean, after... After uh, Bud sold, and I believe he sold like I, I'm, I'm guessing like early '70s. I can't even remember anymore. Um, uh, multiple companies uh, bought and sold Slingerland, um, and they just basically used Slingerland. Never put any money into any equipment. Um, you know, all the stuff was old, old, old. And, uh, you know, they, you know, the guys working there did their best to put out a great product. Um, but they were still fighting with, with all the old equipment, uh, nothing, nothing was brought in new. Um, so that was, that was part of the demise. I mean, you know, you, you, you can only do so much when you have all these antiquated machineries around. Um, and, uh, that that was you know it it just started going downhill after i think after well you know there was still kind of a heyday in the 70s but yeah. you know the later 70s um that's when the the downhill started 
you know, going, um, you know, again, multiple, multiple companies buying and selling. It's just, uh, you know, it wasn't the same as, as the family owned uh, Swingerland. Yeah, I think most famously, there's those going between different companies back and forth. And um, it's currently owned by Gibson, which I'm pretty sure is the most famous. Uh, you know, when people think of Slingerland and saying what went wrong, they'd say, well, Gibson owns it and they didn't do anything. And I know that I read that part of it was because if people, if small shops wanted to um, carry Slingerland, then they also had to carry Gibson guitars, which I think for most people who've ever been to a music store and seen the price of Gibson guitars, um, that's just not feasible for these small shops, which even today on April 16th, 2018, when we're recording this, Gibson is in trouble on their guitar end. Like people can't afford to buy this stuff at this in the current uh, economic climate. So um, I know it. it uh, Gibson kind of gets the, the blame, I think, a little bit for what went wrong with, uh, you know, putting the nail in, in Slingerland's coffin. Well, there was, you know, there was the last owner um, in the Chicago area uh, when when he bought Slingerland. I mean, it was it was like he incurred a lot of debt when he bought it. He actually uh, moved out of the Niles plant, downsized tremendously, uh, moved out to a plant in Algonquin, Illinois, um, and uh, you know had a skeleton crew out there, um, and it it just never really took off. I mean, they basically set up shop there and the bank closed them down. Um, you know, my dad tells me a story of, you know, they were waiting for a a load of veneer and, uh, the owner was at the bank with the checkbook and my dad already said, uh, something's wrong. And, uh, when the guy came back, uh, that was, that was pretty much it. You know, it was just shut down. Um, yeah, so, you know, my my dad kind of just put his keys on the table and walked away, you know. It's like that's it. I'm out of here, you know. Yeah. Um uh, you know, I still am in contact with some some old guys from the plant that I I know. Not I some of them are a little bit older than me. I'm not saying they're ancient, but you know, my dad's probably the the ancient one out of everybody, but um you know, I, I still am in contact with, with some of these guys and, uh, actually some of them are uh, helping us out now. So, um, that's kind of cool. That's a great transition to talk about what you're doing right now, um, with Chicago drum and carrying on the tradition of, um, Slingerland. So now on to you, how, how did, how did this all happen for you where, where you're doing what you're doing? Well, um, we started doing, more restoration work, you know, um, bearing edges, rewrapping and, and that type of deal. And, uh, uh, one of, one of my, uh, associates, um, I hadn't met him before, but he had worked, uh, with my dad and knew my dad. And, and, uh, a couple of years before we started doing the restoration work, I, I had met him and, uh, so we were talking and he's like, well, what if you made a snare drum, you know, and did this and this, you know, and uh, I said, yeah, I could do that. So we, we actually built a drum and, uh, he was, he's actually got a band and plays out locally. And, uh, you know, he, he had the, the snare drum at first cause that's all we had for him. And, uh, it just, it was, it was very cool hearing the sounds of that drum that we made coming out of that hall that he was playing in and uh we kind of took off from there we made him a set you know and he's still playing our stuff and um you know we're we're just doing the uh the same type of of builds that you know we we learned at slingerland we're using the same type of a wood shell makeup um we're just taking it up uh you know a few notches and uh you know taking care of all the little problems that uh you know a mass production uh shop has we're, we're more of a, a smaller boutique at this point and uh we spend a lot of time you know getting everything just right and uh the sound of them is fantastic um everybody loves the uh, sound of our drums so uh we got to be doing something right yeah absolutely so you are uh so you're building them from the ground up are you you're building you're creating the shells then is that right yeah, there are shells and, uh, you know, we do, uh, 
the, the solid maple reinforcement rings, just like the old school and the same type of edges. We're doing, you know, a 30 round over edge on them. Um, you know, very, very precise bearing edges, uh, glass smooth bearing edges, not like the, uh, the old, uh, you know, slinger lens where you could feel ridges all over them. Yep. Uh, you know, that's where your sound comes from. So we take a lot of time, you know, in sanding and, and making sure everything's just right on these things. Well, they are, um, absolutely beautiful drums. Um, I have, uh, not had the pleasure of playing them yet, but I've seen them and, uh, just unbelievable. And like you said, it's just more modern. It's, you know, what, 50 years later, of course, it's going to be just more, more polished and more, and more finished. And I'm assuming you're not using the old, uh, radio frequency machine, right? No, 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 no. This is, uh, totally different now. It's just more modern up-to-date equipment. Um, so we're getting, uh, a pretty pretty perfect shell out of them, so uh, we're very happy with our products. Well, that's great. I mean, you should be proud to. Uh, I mean, you are the guy who is carrying on. Like, for for lack of a better term, you are the new Slingerland drums because Gibson's obviously not doing <laughs> anything with it. I mean, you're the guy. Yeah, well, they're they're sitting on the name, and uh, don't know what's happening with that. But uh, you know, we've we've been we've been forging ahead uh, with Chicago Drum, and you know, so, some people say you know, out of the ashes comes Chicago Drum. Well, to a, to a point that is. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we're 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 doing a lot of lot of things uh, similar but different. Um, you know, we're we're making the old canister thrones. Um, you know. Oh, cool. Just. Uh, Doing a whole bunch of uh, different stuff, um, just trying to work with the customers and, and give them, you know, what they want size wise and, and finish wise, and um, just giving them a, a, a drum that's going to last for decades, like the old Slingerlands. So these are custom. Uh, so if I call you and say I want a drum set, I'm not getting one that's just pulled off the shelf. These are typically made to order, or do you have kind of a, a correct a surplus? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, they're made to order. Awesome. Well, we don't really have a, a catalog set, you know. We we do stuff like like the old catalog, you know, outfits. But uh, um, you know, it's whatever you know somebody would want. Um, they would get in contact with us, and uh, we can make it for them. Cool. Well, I, I uh, encourage people to get in touch with you if they're in need of a uh, beautiful custom kit that has that that vintage feel, but uh, is not gonna let you down in any way with uh, with problems with hardware that can't hold up or anything like that. Yeah, and you say vintage feel, and there is actually a vintage feel on these. The, the rebound of the stick on the heads, uh, there is a vintage feel to these drums. Um, you know, we've we've got the sound, we've got the feel, we've got the look of, of vintage. I mean, uh, our stuff is basically, if you would have bought a set way back in the 40s and 50s type deal, um, 60s, uh, we we nailed the feel and the and the sound. Um, any any type of music you throw at these things, they can handle it. Whether it be blues, rock, jazz, uh, you name it, uh, these can handle it. So, Jim, uh, this has been awesome. I would love to give you the opportunity to uh, let people know where they can find more info about Chicago Drum. Well, you can uh, you can always throw us a uh, email at info at chicagodrum dot com. Um, you can go on our website at Chicago Drum. Uh, just Google Chicago Drum and, and we'll come up. We're not Chicago Drum Exchange. That's a store in Chicago. Uh, they carry all the drum stuff, but uh, we are Chicago Drum. Um, so please, yeah, check us out. Um, we have a lot of sound bites on there, uh, different looks that you can see. Uh, we can browse through our website. You know, we do restorations as well, uh, um, repair work. Uh, that's a big part of the, the business too right now. So, um, you know, we do all sorts of things. So and you if you are... have any problems with your drums, <laughs> take them us. <laughs> and you're typically found at uh, most of the, the drum shows around America, right? Well, we're we're starting to get out there more. I've been I've been traveling out east. We went to the uh, the Delaware show. When was that? In March. Um, I'm heading out on the road again uh, this weekend. Is the uh, Connecticut show? Um, so that'll be uh, Sunday. So if anybody's in the Connecticut area, um, and uh, later on, uh, well, next month. I'm trying to think of the months here. In May um, is the the big granddaddy of all vintage shows in America is the Chicago Drum Show. Um, 
big biggest one in the uh in the states uh anybody uh curious uh drum geeks uh you know whatever but uh if you're in the area that's a, a very good show to see if you're curious all sorts of things there new old um accessories clinics uh there's a whole ton of stuff to do there Awesome, Jim. Well, I really appreciate you being here. Um, Again, folks, this is uh, Jim Moritz from Chicago Drum taking the time to talk to us about uh, Slingerland Drums today. Thank you so much, Jim. Well, thanks, Bart. Thanks for having me. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at the Chicago show. (laughs) Absolutely, man. Thank you. All right. Have a good day. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.